black ball black 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 ball black 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 What is up, everybody? My name is James D. Fiore, and this is Blackballed. Friend of the show, Richard Marsh, um, sort of the person who kicked off all of this coverage of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. Uh, his backstory is fascinating, but it doesn't really start with him in a lot of ways. There is another man in the United Kingdom. His name is also Richard Marsh. He is also uh, an ex-member of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And today we have a, we're seeing double today because we have Richard Marsh and Richard Marsh. Richards, Marshes, welcome to Blackball. How are you guys? I'm fine. Thank you, James. I'm, yes, I'm good. Thank you. Good. Um, Richard, so, uh, you, you were which kind one of, are we, how do we know which one you're talking to? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, UK Richard. <laughs> UK start, Richard, okay. Let's let's start with you. Uh, we we had it. We had Ron Fox on the show recently. We've had Cheryl Hope. We've had Richard March. We've had Carmen Drever. There are all these ex-members with all their own unique stories, and I wanted to have you on after Richard told me a little bit about your backstory because yours is is a little bit unique. You straddle the um, the organization when it was before it was an extremist cult, and then after, and that's sort of when you left. I would like to know what it was like before Jim Taylor Jr., I believe it was, took over and what it was like to be born and raised inside the Brethren before it became the organization that it is today. It was a much happier, much more open, much more evangelical operation. I'm going back now to my childhood. I was born in 1944. So the first 16 or 17 years of my life, um, the only, it was really very friendly, very open. The only restrictions on me, which were slightly difficult to, 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 to uh, live with at school, were no television, um, not going to cinemas. But that was about it, really. Um, and you could sort of con your school friends that you knew, you know, that you knew something about something, and you got through it. It all got really bad in 1960-61, when uh, James Taylor Jr. appeared on the scene. And what was it about his personality? I've heard some stories about him that are just disgusting. Uh, you know, there is a... Uh, disgusting, he was did you say? Yes. Disgusting, yes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. He was accused of rape, I believe. Uh, yep. From, from a, a, I believe he raped a... He was alleged... I don't know. Do I have to say allegedly if he's dead? But, you know, allegedly raped a young man when he was a boy. And then that man, I think, um, uh, accused him of that when he was a grown-up. Yeah. But what was this person like? Like you saw him in the flesh, correct? Uh, like all cult leaders or political leaders, or most of them anyway, apart from British ones, he had tremendous charisma, um, utter self confidence, spoke fluently and logically, superficially, uh, and he he sort of they, the brethren followed him like a flock of sheep. Because he created cult, you know, the whole thing about the brethren, the whole the whole cult, the whole sect is is massive group think on, on a big big scale. And J T. Jr. was very good, I think, at winding people up. As politicians, we won't mention any names in Germany, other places. But 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 you know what I mean. He he managed to get the audience going, get them on his side, get them wound up, and they followed him like sheep to slaughter. I mean, it was quite. Astonishing. Yes, he was found in bed with various sisters, as they're called, which is other other men's wives, and he was he was an utter total alcoholic. Uh, but he got away with it. I mean, the, the, the power of group think to, to tolerate, you know, in a Christian, allegedly Christian, supposedly Christian organization, to to forgive, tolerate, accept such debauchery as as, as the right thing, as a normal thing, is just incredible. That that transitional period between a relatively normal group of religious people to the James Taylor led cult, what was that like? Like, I mean, it it feels like 
again, I, I always come at this from a person who was never inside. So th it's, it's totally different for me to try to even imagine what it would be like. But, you know, before that, like when, when I talked to Ron Fox last night, he was talking about, I asked him straight up if uh, people who, uh, if the people who lead the, the church uh, can speak directly to Jesus, like is that, if that's their claim and if that's what the flock thinks. And he said, yes. So before Jim Taylor showed up, was there any of that stuff? Like was the, the leader before James Taylor showed up uh, someone who they thought had a divine no, um, no. talent to be able to speak directly with Christ? You know, this sort of the sect leader infallibility thing started with James Taylor, I think, and Richard will confirm this, and then became more and more extreme until now, now of course. Um, I think Bruce Hales can modify the Bible and people would accept it. Uh, so, no, it was it was very much more open. It was friendly. Our house was open to all. We lived in Cambridge, open to all the undergraduates and the brethren. And, and you know, life was, was, life was very happy, apart from this one restriction of not having television, not having radio, um, uh, not going to cinemas and pop concerts and things, which I could live with. Everything else was, was couldn't have been better. But it got very miserable and very grim when Jim Taylor appeared on the scene. Did the population of the exclusive brethren, I guess it would be called then, uh, after he took over, would did the pop did the did the numbers shrink because people were just like, okay, well, this is too crazy for me. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah. yeah. There's tremendous risks and schisms all over the place, in particular, of course, caused by his behavior in bed with him, um, with people he shouldn't be in bed with. Um, yes, and I remember my family. I mean, phone calls all night every night between uncles and aunts deciding who was staying in, who was out and terrible rows going on and, and, and people in tears and people saying, well, I'll never speak to you again if you do this or you don't do that. And it was, it was two or three years of, of hell when the whole thing sort of imploded and then reformed itself is what, what, is what we see today. And unfortunately what, what reformed was, was, in my view, possibly evil. I mean, it's just a terrible cult. It's just it's abusing people's lives. It's, um, it's, and uh, my understanding is that, so you were roughly 17 when you, I, yeah. I, I don't, is it better to say that you left or you were pushed out? I, ne I never actually broke bread with them. That was, that was the big row. I, my, my, I had a very fanatical brother, two brothers, one's Richard's uh, father there, but, um, but he was, he was far more laid back. But my younger brother, um, they were trying very hard to get me to break bread with them. And I said, well, I did not understand what you're talking about. And I, as I said to you earlier, James, you know, I said that one of the classic questions I asked is, are you telling me, it's just because, it, sorry, just going back a bit, it's two Timothy two thing, they interpret as meaning you, you, sh you shouldn't eat with unbelievers. And I said, well, does that mean I can't have a cup of tea with the local vicar, minister, priest, padre, or whatever you call these, these nice chaps in Canada? Uh, my brother said, absolutely, you can't. It's a sin. I said, it's a mortal sin to have a cup of tea with a local vicar. Oh, yes. I, I just I just thought it was so utterly illogical. And um, he then denounced me in a large meeting and and sort of publicly it made it very public that I was either to join or I was going to be cast out. And um, I said, well, I'm not joining. I'm sorry. And so at the age of 17, I was stuck out in the caravan near Cambridge in a very cold field and a very uninsulated caravan. <laughs> I shall never forget it. And uh, then from then on, I had to make my own way in life. I was, you know, that was it. And I, but my brother was, I shouldn't be quite so disloyal to my brother, but I mean, it does hurt a lot. But he, at that time, and shortly afterwards, when I met the lady who's now my wife, he declared to her, found me to me and to everybody else, uh, everybody else, uh, my marriage wouldn't work. He declared that I'd be lucky if I got a job digging holes in the road because I would never make anything in life because I was not uh, not uh, in the brethren and uh, generally sort of cursed me left, right and centre. And it wasn't, for a teenager, that's really not good. And today, Richard tells me I've got something like 70, 75 nieces, nephews, great nieces, great nephews, great, great, greats, because I'm nearly a thousand years old. And you know, apart from Richard, if they, any of those 70 something nieces, nephews, et cetera, of mine walked through that door here, I wouldn't know them from the bar of soap. So it's been a life completely isolated from my family for over 60 years now. Richard uh, from Canada. Um, 
I, I just heard uh, your uncle say that uh, he felt disloyal, and I'll get back to you again, Richard, in the UK. But that disloyal to his brother. But I, I just but everything he said just sounded the opposite to me. It sounded like you, his brother was disloyal to him. I, I, am I interpreting that as like uh, a, an old reflex that um, of you know, like a brethren implanted reflex, or is that just a, what a decent person would say? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well. For those who've been inside, and particularly, particularly those like me who've been brainwashed or have observed the brainwashing, you do you do have a certain sympathy for persons who may do things to you that seem incredibly mean, uh, but then you also understand that probably in their own mind they genuinely feel that they're doing you a favour by treating you this way. They genuinely think they're doing the very best for you by being so severe. And so there's always kind of two sides to the story. This isn't a story about someone who's a, a sociopath or is incredibly mean and decided to cast his brother out and treat him like this. This is a story about someone who was brainwashed into believing that the best possible thing he could do for his brother was to subject him to this. Yeah. Um, but did you guys know each other? Uh, right. May I just say, I knew that at the time. I felt terribly sorry for him. I felt sorry for my parents. And I don't hold it against them. I'm just, just yeah. stating factually what happened. But I, I don't resent it. I, I fully understand the, the sort of mental, psychological condition they were in. And I feel very sorry for them. Um. Richard in the UK, can you hold on to your wire so that your mic doesn't brush against your shirt? Is that okay? Um, you, you don't have to hold it up or anything, just as long as it doesn't touch your shirt and, and rustle right, around there. Right, that's fine. Right, um, okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Did you guys know each other before? Like like when you were, or were you already gone by the time uh, you, Richard, uh, were born? Yeah, I, was born in, I was born in 71. So, okay. so um, 10 years. Uncle, yeah. yeah, Uncle Richard well, I mean, I, I departed. Don't... Richard, I don't know what you were told about me. What were you told about me by my brothers? It's a good question. Yeah, my parents um, often, well, not very often, but they, they spoke about you several times. They always spoke about you uh, with a certain amount of sorrow. And I think they told me that you had been badly treated and that you shouldn't have been, you shouldn't have been put out in a caravan at that young age. Um, but they, I don't think they would have said that in, in public, so to speak. They wouldn't have said that in the presence of other brethren. But I was kind of uh, allowed to know that uh, you had been mistreated. Um, so there was a certain sympathy there. And I think, I believe they actually named me after you, which was a bit of a, a bold thing to do, which suggests that they weren't, quite so fully brainwashed as other members of the brethren at that point. Maybe they wanted to, you know, maybe it was a redemption naming and I'm not trying to be funny, but do you know what I mean? Like yeah. the first Richard Marsh failed the brethren. Maybe this one will do it some justice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it, and you wanted to get an education. Oh, actually, let me, let me, let me, rephrase or actually change the question entirely you left i don't know what a caravan is that sounds like british lingo because over here it's a minivan <laughs> but no, it's uh, not a minivan that minivan's got an engine in hasn't it this is a, a trailer yeah. van you know a trailer I think. oh okay like an rv without a motor you know? okay and you, where did you, you hook on the back of a car and tow along one of those things I know that Richard in Canada here doesn't understand any of my pop references i'm going to make one anyways but it reminds me of truman's world with jim carrey you know, you're 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 living in a world that is a bubble um, and that you're isolated. And then one day you find out there's a whole new world out there. What was the first few years like for you? Like, I feel like you were walking around half afraid and half in awe of what you were seeing. Uh, you, me, you're talking to me? Yes, I am. In UK. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I just I, I was kicked out and I thought, well, I better embrace the world as, as I find it. So through a series of jobs and a bit of help from uh, uncles who had also been kicked out. I was able to get to university in London. I was able to get married, able to get a very good job. And um, and life has been fantastic ever, ever since, in spite of the 
<laughs> the, the, the predictions of my the horrific um, end my brother was predicting. I, fortunately, life's been utterly and totally opposite of that. It's just been a, uh, it's just been the last sixty years. Of course, I haven't known any family until Richard rang up one day. Um, other than that, I've made got a wonderful family of my own, and I've made friends all over the place and had a great life. But there's this, there is this great sort of sorrow uh, that, 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 that I don't know my my genetic family in Cambridge anymore. Never have, never will. They're not going to speak to me again. So um, that's that. Well, if you have 75 nieces and nephews and you're looking for your genetic background, you might be Italian. Just throwing <laughs> that out there. <laughs> um, what what, uh, what did you end up doing as a career? I became an aeronautical engineer. I spent 12 years on the Concorde design team in Bristol. Oh, wow. And when we finished Concorde, we were, in those days, that company was British Aerospace. British Aerospace was owned by an engineering company you may have heard of called Vickers. Vickers were opening up the North Sea. They were hiring trawlers. They were sticking bounce diving systems on the back of trawlers and fishing boats, going out in the North Sea to get the North Sea oil business up and running. And in the process, they were killing lots of divers. So we in British Aerospace said, look, it's not an awfully good idea. Uh, we've just finished Concorde. We know what we're doing. Why don't we design remotely operated vehicles and submarines to where we can replace divers? And Vickers said, yes, we do that because we're killing far too many people. Um, so I really then spent the rest of my career in ROVs. We created our own ones in Bristol. Then I came to Aberdeen, where I am, Aberdeen Shire, where I am now. And we pioneered, actually, all the remotely operated vehicles and robotic uh, engineering stuff that was done by the North Sea. And that spun off into, into navies of the world and all over the planet now. You'll find ROVs doing all sorts of clever stuff. That, it makes me think career. of all the wasted talent that must exist inside these localities now, um, Richard in Canada. I mean, the, you know, wh when did you meet your uncle? And, and I mean, how impressed were you to find out what kind of career he had? I mean, this is, I mean, that is, that is pretty high level stuff. Yes, hundred percent. And of course, if he had remained in the brethren, um, it had reached a point along with all these other restrictions that, that James Taylor Jr. brought in, he, he banned university education. So, if my uncle hadn't left the Brethren or been kicked out of the Brethren at that point, he would never have had a university education and would probably have been a, a bricklayer or a lawn care operative. Um, and the so world Italian. would have been a poorer place. Yeah. Or, yeah, or an ice cream man, possibly. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. A gelato, right? gelato maker. Yeah. <laughs> when did you meet Richard in um, Canada? When did you meet your uncle? It would be, it would have been around 20, shortly after I left, so 2016, 2017. Um, took me a while to sort of pluck up the courage to make the connection, because even after I'd left, I still had a lot of um, inhibitions. You, when, when you're raised with a whole load of rules and regulations, and you're taught that they're kind of moral laws, they become an inhibition, and you feel guilty about doing things, even if you rationally know that there's nothing wrong with it. So one thing in the Brethren is that people who are out of the Brethren are regarded as being particularly dangerous, uh, particularly dark, you might say. So it took a certain amount of plucking up courage to make the connection and seek out my uncle. Um, so when I first spoke to him on the phone, he was, of course, astonished and very happy to hear from me and very amazed at my story. And he immediately invited me to come up and see him and sent me the money for an air ticket up to Aberdeen. Um, so I flew up to Aberdeen and he met me at the airport. And it was a very strange moment for me because he looks extremely like my grandfather. Family likeness is extremely close. And he, he spoke and his kind of sense of humor and his bearing very much reminded me of my father. So there's sort of an instant family link, you know, I felt as if I'd known him all my life, even though this was our, our first meeting. So that was, uh, what was that meeting like for you, Rich, uncle Richard? I'm going to call you uncle Richard. No, it was amazing. It was very emotional. And it was, uh, yes. Richard is very similar to my brother, David, his father. 
and it was a, a, a high point in, in my life to to actually find some some family again. As I said, out of the seventy two, I didn't know there was one who I've grown to know and love very much over the last six years. You know what? I, I didn't really expect this, even though I, I should have assumed anyways, but this might be the first time we've had uh, ex-brethren members on the show where I can think of something happy, <laughs> which is your, which is you two being able to meet for the first time, especially since, um, you know, uh, later on in life, like, you you know, did you know that Richard, uh, Uncle Richard, did you know that your nephew existed? Oh, yes, before? I did. I knew, but I, knew, I knew exactly how many children my, my brothers and my sister had. But it's the generations beyond that, which I have, haven't a clue about. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Because I was able, I, I used to gate crash Cambridge two or three times. I was never invited. But I'd turn up at the front door of my parents' house, my brother's house. They thought I was happy in Sconston, Aberdeen, which is about 600 miles from Cambridge. But uh, my wife had some relatives in Cambridge. So when we down, went down to see my wife's relatives, I would just gate crash my family. And they kind of sheepishly let me in and they'd offer a cup of tea as long as they didn't have a cup of tea. So a cup of tea was sort of slid across the table with a, with a stale biscuit and they would, but they would all sit around looking at me without actually taking a cup of tea themselves. So they, and it was obviously fairly painful for them. But yes, so I was, was aware of the next generation, Richard's generation. But beyond that, as I say, it's a complete mystery to me. That, that doesn't sound like that'd be something that would happen in modern times in the Brethren, would it? Being no, able no. to... To, to go and revisit friends and no, family. It, it, not, no, because uh, that's right. That, that's, that's probably going back 15, 20, 30 years now. Four or five years ago, Richard was here in my house and we tried to call his mother just because I went to I don't know, he didn't see his mother again, just because I didn't see my mother again. So I, I phoned up his mother, whose name is Jean, and I said, Jean, I want to speak to you, and you know, Richard's here, but she wouldn't speak to him, just put the phone down. But we're sinners. We're, we're evil. That's ridiculous, of course. Yeah. But it's very, very sad. A guy like me would just instantly burst into flames if I walked into, into that church. Like, if you guys are sinners, my gosh. You know? Like, there is a... Um, uh, when, when we were talking, uh, Richard, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Yanya Lalich about... Uh, and she was the uh, world's... I think she's the world's leading expert on cults. If not, she's one of them. And about how um, there is no law that uh, is on the books in English common law in Commonwealth countries that um, covers that type of brainwash and coercion. No. And, and I remember saying to her, um, and Richard in Canada, I'll, I'll direct this towards you. I remember saying to her that, you know, it feels like Western democracies are the perfect place to start a cult um, because, and I'm not saying you should be able to take away the freedom of expression or the freedom of religion, but it is being that that freedom is weaponized against people and their faith is weaponized against them as well. And I don't think that that's what, you know, the drafters, the, the spirit of the law was, it, it's not intended for that, obviously. So, um, you know, when I hear, when I hear stuff like that, like, like going to visit your mom and, and your mom or, or, or a relative, a close relative of any kind, and them just, you know, can't, they can't wait to, for you to finish your tea so that you can disappear for another 20 years is, I, I don't even know how to react to that. You see, part of the problem is that all politicians are very, in the West are very proud to defend freedom of religion. This, of course, gives these people a license to do very much what they like because freedom of religion is a very important thing. And, and we've got a lot of MPs in the House of Commons here who've been sort of chatted up by the brethren, brethren and, and support them. And, and although we point out this terrible abuse of children not being allowed to go to university, bright, bright children not allowed to go to university, bright, bright children who, who have all sorts of freedoms removed from them, it's, it's all excused under the freedom of religion um, banner which which of course is complete nonsense because it's actually abuse it's abuse of, of, of human beings but it's it, they get away with it yeah and, and i think one of the things that i've noticed about theocracies in the world like nations that are that, that are theocratic is that if you show me a a country that has a theocracy and a bad economy i'll show you a nation that oppresses women 
Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take away half your brain power, and what are you left with? Yeah. You know, and um, I, I want to pivot a little bit though, because you just mentioned something about the uh, House Commons and the MPs. We have the same problem here. Um, MPs that are aligned with this cult that yeah. accept money, uh, donations from this cult. This is to either one of you, just because I don't know the answer, and I don't know who. Maybe Uncle Richard might have a better grasp on it. I'm not sure. How does the political donation system work in the UK? Like, are you allowed to donate any sum of money? Is there a cap? Is it yeah, just there's, there's uh, individuals? There's, I think it's a, there's a five thousand pound cap after which it has to be declared publicly. So, all sorts of devious and dubious people can bung in £4,999, for which the MP will be very grateful, and it will not be made public. So yes, there is an ability to sort of go in under the under the radar there. Yeah. Um, well, that's go ahead, very Richard. significant, because of course, an organisation like the Brethren, with 16,000 individual members in the UK, can, can arrange for each of those members to give up to the uh, £5,000 cap. And the whole thing is completely, completely invisible. So very, very large sums of money can be channeled by Bruce Hales in Australia via his obedient servants in the UK to any politician he cares to name without any public disclosure at all. Um, yeah, and that that is one of the problems. I, I it's. It's a commonality between um, all these localities, uh, New Zealand, Australia, UK. I, I, I'm not familiar enough with the United States. I'm sure it happens there as well. It's probably worse there because of the way that the political culture is in the United States. But um, they, I, I still, I can't get over how interesting it is uh, to, you know, that in the 50s, it, this organization wasn't like this at all. And then you just fast forward a few decades later and they've been corporatized. And it was like the more that they corporatized the cult, the more strict they became on the religious side. And so it's like one side feeds the other. Um, you know, Uncle Richard, do you have any like, have you, you've had a lot of time to think about all this stuff. Was there ever, you know, did you ever think, you know, how, how can this organization be stopped? Were you ever active in the fight against them or anything like that? Well, until... Over the last five or ten years, nobody seemed to be fighting against them, probably were, but the advent of media, all the various forms of social media, plus people like Richard, intelligent young men and middle-aged men coming out, yes, we're getting more and more and more, and people like you, of course, James, thank you very much, we're getting a more, more oxygen into the, into the thing. Uh, we are able to communicate around the planet instantly. So, yes, I... I Historically, no, but yes, now I'm going to do everything I possibly can for the few few years I have left to to see if we can do something about it because it's a terrible abuse of young people. That's what really upsets me. The, you know, the fact they can't go to university, the fact that they have this weird life, they have to work in brethren companies, they can't go out into the world and be entrepreneurs. They can't. Yeah, it's just it's, it is it, it should there should be quite an awful cliche. But there should be laws against it. I mean, it should not be allowed in the Western world to stop people going to university, to force people to work in, in, in certain companies. It's slavery. Uh, to force people to go to certain schools which are full of propaganda. It's evil stuff. And it needs to be exposed. I mean, we need to do something about it. And I'm, I'm spend the rest of my life and my small fortune doing, doing what I can to oppose it, to make it, uh, get rid of it. But I, it's, I'm afraid it's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. Um, how proud of you were? How proud were you of, of of your nephew when you found out what he had done? A man and, of enormous um, courage. And, a man of enormous courage. Very, very proud indeed. I mean, he, as you know, I'm sure, he lost his job, he lost his wife, he lost his house, he lost everything, and he won't see his children again, probably for the rest of his life, or his grandchildren. And yet he's fighting this battle. He's not being pursued by the brethren. And there's all sorts of lawsuits flung at him, both in the UK and I gather in Canada, people chasing him in Canada. He's a hero, that young man. Richard, are you going to cry? Oh. Do you want a tissue? Oh, no, you're British. You I don't cry. Have a little wee. <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> We're just joking. Yeah. No, he's, he's been fantastic, and he's been an inspiration to all of us. It's uh, Richard's courage is remarkable. I agree. Um, and I've had so many emails from people telling me the same thing. Uh, and um, 
you know, there is a, uh, I, I'm, first of all, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Richard, but I, I really should thank you. Like, the, you know, there, I have been freelancing for 20, 22 years, I think. And, you know, I never, you know, I was, I, at first you want to get a byline in a big paper and then you just want a job and then you want to cover a big story. You want to break them and things like that. Then maybe you start going into things that interest you. But I don't know if I've ever had a passion quite like this before. Like this is the first time that I felt like I was covering a story that I wanted to see through. I haven't thought about money once. I don't get paid for for doing what I'm doing with you guys. Like I'm, I'm, I, my podcast, it's not monetized. I I just I do it. I have pretty good reach, but you know it's it's not for the money because the money doesn't exist. But I, I you know this is the first time I have felt, and especially when you came on and and, and when Cheryl came on, after that podcast, I I you know I I, I wept. <laughs> I'll just tell you, you know, it was it was. In a, in a, I haven't watched it again. Put it that way, uh, because I'm I I I I experienced it firsthand when when she was on, and I I don't think I can bring myself to watch it again. I I, I can you know I wrote about it. That was hard enough. Um, and but it made me stop and realize that sometimes when when you're when you're trying to do news and when you're using a medium like podcasting, which is vastly different from newspapers and television. You know, you feel like you can you can help. Um, lately, I've been wavering between being frustrated and being inspired. Um, I'm going to continue to do it, um, but you know, it, it like whatever frustration you were feeling, um, you know, is, is is ten times greater than than what I'm feeling right now. But um, you know, I, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, because you have really been become like this first domino of sorts in this in this mission of mine to take down this cult. And I got to say, I know that um, a lot of people that I speak with uh, that uh, used to be members are still very religious and that's totally fine. I actually think that maybe being a non-believer because I'm an atheist is, is, is part of my inspiration to take it down. I have since learned to respect people's faiths um, in the last couple of years that has to do with things like grieving and how I'm envious of the grieving process when you're a religious person, but your story both of your stories, Cheryl, Carmen, I have been able to find this really interesting nook where I'm still a non-believer, but I I so appreciate that people's people were be able were able to escape a situation where their faith was weaponized against them, and like Ron Fox was talking about last night, being able to find their way to a new. Um, more rewarding type of individualized faith in God. And and I find that really, I'm surprised that I even think like this now. And, uh, you know, your story is a big part of that. Yeah, well, I mean, fundamentally, religion can be used for good and it can be used for evil. Um, religion isn't fundamentally evil or good. It, it's, uh, if you like, it's a tool of psychological manipulation uh, that's rather a pejorative way of putting it or it's a, a tool of mental health and healing uh it, it can be used and and to give you an example the aa alcoholics anonymous program is based on christian principles and concepts of a higher being and seeking help outside of yourself um and it's the most potent way of curing uh, addiction to alcohol but the same the same uh, psychological techniques and manipulations if you want to use that word can be used for incredible evil to control mm -hmm. people and make them do the cruelest things to themselves and and to the people they love um so when we talk about religious freedom yes people should have religious freedom to use religion for good, but they shouldn't have the freedom to use religion for evil. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, I was an alcoholic. Uh, I didn't go through AA, but I had a much more potent um, 
uh, way to reconcile my drinking, which is uh, complete and utter hatred from my wife. So that worked. Um, and now I don't drink anymore. It's pretty effective. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Um, is there anything next for you, Uncle Richard, like in this arena of fighting against this cult? Are you, is there anything that you're going to be doing? You don't have to say it if you don't want to on the podcast. Um, and have, are you worried uh, still in this day and age, uh, you know, where you are now in your life of any potential blowback? Or is that fear gone now? Well, that fear is gone. I, I'm not, not, not worried about any, anything physical or anything financial. I, I, I no doubt I could get into legal trouble with them because they're a very disinclative lot. They, they, they might have a go at me if I, I write letters, I, write, I support people financially, I'll, I'll encourage groups. I, I read an awful lot of stuff which I pass around those who are outside the Brethren and are fighting it. Um, yeah, I'll do, I do whatever I can. I'm not a, I've still got a pretty active life in, in business and family, but I'll do whatever I can to expose this cult because it is utterly cruel. Families, it's breaking families, it's causing suicides. It's allegedly there's child abuse which is covered up, there are all sorts of other crimes covered up, I suspect. Particularly the taxman should should know about a few things. Mm. Um, and of course, I'm I, yes, we've got to fearlessly expose it. Um, did you guys ever think of maybe pulling a prank on uh, the the cult? Because uh, Richard in Can <laughs> well, Richard in Canada, you have a gag order. Right, so you're not allowed to talk about certain things, but Richard in UK, you could talk about it. I so maybe if you, anyway, yeah, you, you, we, you create the gag, and I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah. well, we could say we could maybe set them up so they libel Richard in the UK by telling him that he is a. I don't know. Maybe I'm just overthinking this, but I, I thought maybe uh, you know. <laughs> any, a, a any, good... any good pranks welcome here. We yeah. need to laugh in life. <laughs> That's true. It's been lots of misery. <laughs> Um, Richard, are you going to, are you, your, your travel situation is a little dicey right now. So you're staying in Canada for the foreseeable future. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be here for the next couple of years, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap it there cause we have another podcast that's coming on. Um, unless there's something that I am completely, uh, forgetting about that I should add to this. Cause you know, I don't want to leave with one of you not satisfied with the content. No, no, Anything? James, no? fantastic. Thank you for what you're doing. It's very important. It's important I appreciate that. Important work. Carry on with it, please. Well, I'm going to have you guys both. Richard, you'll be on again probably sometime soon. Uncle Richard, I'm going to have you on again as well. I have this like weird idea that I want to get like six of you on at the same time um, and just go around the horn and we can make up nicknames for Bruce Hale or something like that. Very That'd happy. <laughs> Very happy to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay, Uncle have Richard, fun. Uncle bye Richard bye, thank Richard. you so much. Thank bye you so bye, much James. for joining thank us. Thank you. Uh, Richard Marsh, uh, your uncle is super charming. Yes, he's yes. yeah he seems like a very nice guy i i'm super happy for you because um I, I didn't think about it until today even though obviously i knew that you had a relationship with him how potent it must be to finally have a blood relative that you can like see in the flesh and not have to worry about anything well exactly yes and of course my aunt is also extremely nice aunt mm -hmm. pamela um plus i have some of my father's and my uncle's cousins up there in in scotland who are very interesting people who I got to meet for the first time and saw what they do. So yes, it was, um, yes, extraordinary sort of family reunion, except it wasn't a reunion because I'd never met any of them before. Um, well, that um, makes sense. it does make sense. And uh, I, I'm super happy for you guys. Really like you, you guys have a pretty extraordinary bloodline. It seems like as far as like, you know, you guys are mad. Nah, maybe it's the accent, but you guys, very, you, you seem very charming and intelligent. So I'm going to, yeah. yeah, both yeah. of you are. And uh, I listen, I, you know how I appreciate you. So thank you again for coming on. We'll probably see you on early next week with whoever else that we have on at that time. Yeah. And uh, I'll give you a call after the podcast. Okay, brother. Yep. Thank you. Okay. James. Thanks Richard. Yeah. Richard Marsh and his uncle, Richard Marsh. Um, Wow, what a breath of fresh air that podcast was compared to all of the other ones. Uh, and I'm not taking anything away from those people who have come on and, and, and shared their courageous stories. But just as a break from the typical brethren stuff that we talk about, um, it was nice to, uh, to share a laugh and, and, and to actually uh, take two members, two ex-members, and, uh, and, and listen to their sort of like happy reunion uh, of sorts. Um, and, and so that was, that was really rewarding for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to Richard and his uncle Richard, uh, for joining us today. Uh, tonight 
It's a double header today on Blackball. Tonight at 10.30 Eastern Time, I thought I'd, uh, I I needed something just a little bit lighter. So we're going to have urban warfare expert John Spencer on the, on the podcast. Uh, John Spencer is uh, an author, and he is, as mentioned, uh, one of the world's foremost experts on urban warfare. His book is entitled Connected Soldiers, Life, Leadership, and Social Connections in Modern War. And the reason why I'm having him on tonight is to discuss the Russia and Ukraine conflict. Uh, th- there, there are certain elements of the politics and the conflict that uh, I am finding not troubling but confusing. And, and it centers around not who I'm rooting for in this war. I'm clearly rooting for Ukraine. But like in every country, there are certain things that uh, leave a bad taste in my mouth. Often there are no good guys in fights. In this one, clearly Russia is the aggressor. Clearly Russia is the country that, uh, you know, has invaded another country. I understand the, uh, I heard Noam Chomsky talk not too long ago about the NATO provocation element of this war. And and I mean, I find that interesting. I don't, th- I think it's important for people to realize that when you talk about things like war, and you make a point that is a criticism, a constructive criticism even, about the side that's being attacked, it doesn't mean that you're equalizing anything. It doesn't mean that you're both sizing the art- the argument. It just means that uh, sometimes, you know, Russia could be attacking a country that doesn't deserve to be attacked, and then that country, Ukraine, uh, might have certain uh, pockets of... Uh, you know, extremism or, or what have you. I also have a hesitancy to um, show admiration to Zelensky because he reminds me a little bit of Justin Trudeau. I see a lot of uh, propaganda and I'm not using that term in the, you know, Nazi type context, but you know, everything is propaganda nowadays, but the photo ops, I don't know if you guys saw, I'm going to show it tonight when John Spencer's on, uh, you know, of, of Zelensky and his wife standing in front of worn torn buildings and busted up vehicles and looking dramatic. And it just, you know, I, I'm looking at that and, and, and it reminded me of Trudeau with his teddy bear uh, doing the photo op uh, in Kamloops, I believe it was. And so John Spencer will be an interesting cat to talk about that. Again, he's an expert in urban warfare, but we're also going to touch on the propaganda side of war a little bit. And so hopefully you guys can join me for that. Again, that's at 1030 Eastern time. And uh, we will see you then on Black Ball. Thanks for joining everybody. We appreciate it. Black Ball. Black, black, black Ball. Black, 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 black,